Well, I think by now everyone knows who Alex Berenson is, but of course Alex joins us again today. It is a privilege to have him here. If you don't know who he is, he is a New York Times writer. He's an award-winning uh, author. He has multiple books out there, way more than you know, in fact. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of his nonfiction books like Pandemia, How Coronavirus Hysteria Took Over Our Government, Rights, and Lives, uh, Tell Your Children About Cannabis, and lo and behold, something about the things that uh, Alex says, they have a way of becoming true. Or being being they go from controversial to matter of fact, and it takes a minute, but they eventually get there. And I think I probably found Alex because of that first cannabis book, and uh, he started saying some very interesting things about coronavirus and about vaccines. And a lot has gone on since uh, he last was with us. You can follow him on at alexberenson.com, B-E-R-E-N-S-O-M. Also at Alex Berenson on Twitter. There's a whole Twitter story there where he was uh, an object of uh, some of the the uh, Censorship there and alexberenson.substack.com. The Substack is unreported truths. Let's get to Alex Berenson. Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And welcome, as I said, I was just over on the live chat at Rumble. And Susan will just spo spontaneously start laughing out loud, not say anything, just start laughing. And I always know it's the Rumble rant, guys. So uh, yeah. thank you for entertaining, Said Good Susan. afternoon from Communist Canada. Oh, of course, Commie Canada. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So as I said, let me just review again a little bit about Alex. Um, hey, Caleb, do you have the cannabis book? I didn't get the full title up there. Maybe you could put that up there, as well as the coronavirus book, Pandemia, How Coronavirus Hysteria Took Over Our Government Rights and Lives. Uh, there is Pandemia. <clears throat> and that was written eh, midway through. And let's, let's kind of review some of the some of the observations that Alex had there. And we've got a lot to talk about as far as the vaccine goes today as well. Please welcome Alex Berenson. Welcome. Drew, good to be here. So, pandemia was what about 12, 14 months ago? Uh, Fifteen. Now it came out in uh, in in early or sorry, late twenty twenty one. Feels like a long time ago. Um, in fact, it, I was it, talking. It, 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 go ahead. Sorry, go on. You're talking. Uh, I was I was talking to Regnery, the publisher, about uh, you know updating it, and I sort of felt like you know what, maybe I mean I want an update because it's hard. You know, if we're going to put out a paperback which people, some people want, um, we should have an update. And then I thought there's so much that's happened. Like maybe I, maybe I just need another book, um, which would really be focused yeah. on the vaccines. Um, yeah, there is so much that has happened. And, and I've learned a ton since the last time we spoke, there's just been all kinds of data, but I'm wondering, uh, let's kind of evaluate your, the, your book. Uh, what did you get right? What did you get wrong? I think it's always a useful exercise to sort of think about things. Any of us that we got right, what we got wrong. Unfortunately, the government isn't willing to do this, but the rest of us can go through this exercise. I mean, I, I would say the the number one thing that I got wrong, uh, I was the number one thing that I got wrong was I was hopeful in the summer of 2020 that maybe we were on the way out of this because there seemed to be this pattern in in a lot of places, you know, first in New York and then in the South and Southwest of a lot of cases. And then the cases just, you know, there was a big peak and then they went way down. And, yeah. you know, there was some evidence out there of cross reactivity among T cells. And maybe I was hopeful that there were a lot of people who had some immunity and they weren't going to get infected. And that proved not to be the case. Everybody had to get infected. And whether you're vaccinated or not, everybody had to get infected. Um, so I, w I was wrong about that. Um, uh, you know, look, I didn't, I didn't bet the farm on that, but I was, I, you know, I wrote a piece in, I think, the summer of 2020 saying, hopefully, maybe we're, this is going to go away faster than we think. That was wrong. Um, I, I will, let, I will let me say, stop you. Let, let me let, let me stop at that point. But at that point, we really weren't familiar with Omicron. In, in reality, had it been Alpha and Delta, you might have been right. But it it morphed into something far more contagious and far less virulent. 
yes, that's 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 definitely true. Um, I, I also, I mean, I, you know, I said I estimated six hundred thousand deaths in an unreported truce booklet in June of twenty twenty. Now you can say that was wrong and low. I mean, that was actually an incredibly high estimate at that time. So I actually, you know, and, and frankly, the way we count deaths, and certainly in, in the Omicron era, the way we count deaths is absurd. Um, you know, the, right. the idea that two or three hundred people are still dying of this virus every day is nonsense. It's these are really old, sick people who are dying with this now. I mean, more than ever. That was always a little bit true, yeah. but I think now it's 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 mostly true. So that was wrong. And then, I mean, I I guess, and this is. I mean, I, I guess I thought that people would respond more rationally starting in April 2020. I thought, yeah. look, the we were very scared in, in February and March. And as soon as it became clear that this couldn't crush the health system, no matter how bad it got. And I think, you know, New York City, as bad as it was, and I talk about this a lot in pandemia, it could not crush the health system. Even under those circumstances, I thought there'd be a return to rationality across the country very quickly after that. And that was completely wrong. Um, you know, saw a couple and, and of why states. Not? Well, I mean, why didn't it return. It, that's, that's really the question. A combination of politics and certain, you know, imperatives in the public health system, which, I, you know, I wrote a big sub stack about this uh, just two days ago. There's a guy named Mike Osterholm, who's a very well-known epidemiologist, okay? And Osterholm has COVID now. He's, he, he just turned 70. He got COVID probably the night of his birthday, you know, happy birthday, three years, no COVID. Now you got, now you got Omicron. And, he, and that's not what's interesting, okay? Because everybody has gotten COVID and many people have gotten it more than once. What's interesting is that this guy, three years in, is still masking with an N95 whenever he goes out testing people before he sees them has been vaccinated five times he's gotten five shots not not three or four five shots and 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 he's okay he's 70 he's not 90 and he's not in terrible shape he's a little bit heavy but he's not you know he's not morbidly obese or anything this is how for and this is what i wrote about so you know nutritionists and you probably you know you probably see this in your professional career all the time nutritionists have very high rates of eating disorders. Psychiatrists and psychologists have higher than average rates of mental illness. I think probably epidemiologists, you know, it's the opposite of the guy who just strides into the Ebola epidemic unafraid. I suspect these people are drawn to this because they have a, they, I don't want to say a morbid, but in some cases a morbid fear of these epidemics, or in some cases they have a hero complex where they see them everywhere and they want to end them. I think that this is probably a real thing that that beyond the fact that all their financial incentives are driving them to, you know, say this is worse so that they, you know, can, so that it can continue and they can get research funding and everything else. I think there's probably a psychological component to this where they, you know, I can't quit you, COVID. And so that, you know, that unfortunately, it, that that played into the media and, you know, it certainly played into dem the Democratic side of, you know, the, the spectrum. And it got very, very hard to get out of the ditch that we drove into in the spring of 2020. Speaking of, I, I told Alex a story about my dropping into a ditch this afternoon. That's called priming, Alex. I primed you to bring up that bring up that image. <laughs> I did. I did drive into a ditch today. But, but, but yeah, I I think that is accurate. I think both are probably accurate. I think the phobic quality is definitely there. You can see it in the way they talk about it. But I want to talk a little more about this, what you're calling a hero complex. I've been saying now for several weeks, maybe even a couple of months, that the opioid epidemic was line and verse the same phenomenology as this pandemic. And at the core of the, of the phenomenon is evangelical physicians, evangelical clinicians who decided is their God-given priority to save the world, in the case of opiates, from pain. And there, I, give a pre, I give a lecture where I quote after quote after quote by about five of these guys, you know, Porter and Jick and these guys that were responsible for really getting this thing going, that we, this was a white coat profession. Anyone that got in the way of it was a bad person, that sound familiar, who was interested in harming people. And then because they were so evangelical, they were able to get a hold of the professional societies the Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation, the VA, the medical boards, the 
the insurance companies sound familiar and pain is the fifth vital sign became this yep. thing that was adopted first by the VA and everybody else. And I spent 10 years fighting like a maniac against this thing. And it was a juggernaut just like this. It was so, this was so familiar to me that yep. if you update the book, I hope you will do this. And of course the, the drug company it sees who the evangelists are and, and just puts them on a rocket ship. Let me introduce you to the regulators. Let me introduce you to the state societies. Let me pay you 10 grand to go out and speak. Let me pay for your transportation as you go around the country. Dr. Um, what was her name? They went around the country uh, evangelizing Dr. for uh, lockdown. Dr. Burks, let me let me let me send you around. Dr. Burks, let me send you around because you know we we're you know right. Sound familiar? I mean, it's the same damn thing. And if you if I swear to God, if you see an evangelical, that's that's mad doctor stuff. We just don't know. We think it's somebody doing good, but there's untoward potential for harm. Well, I mean, it's it's funny you say that because I have actually thought the same thing. Um, and you know, and, and you're exactly right. I mean, you know, the, the two great, you know, medically caused epidemics of the last, I mean, what's happened with opioids is horrible. And I think there's, a, you know, considerable evidence that virology caused this pandemic. And we are, you know, I mean, we'll see. We, we may never see, but I think certainly a, a fair look at the evidence suggests more likely than not, much more likely than not, that this, this came out of a lab. Um, and then we'll see just how bad the mRNA is proved to be. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, we are still finding that out, and I think, sort of, on a on a weekly and monthly basis, it looks worse. I I, I don't I don't know where it you know where the bottom is, but uh, but I'm not more optimistic about sort of the long term effects of the mRNAs than I was a year ago, unfortunately. Um, but but you're well, exactly right, and you know the one thing I would emphasize more than you even is the drug companies, right? So whether it's Purdue. Or you know Johnson and Johnson, which made money on fentanyl, or you know this 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 little company that went broke called Insys. So they, you know there are those guys, and then the money that was made in the vaccines and in other and actually in COVID therapeutics too, and the and the monoclonals, which actually do work by the way, but, but you know remdesivir, which doesn't work very well, billions of dollars made in that, over a hundred billion dollars made in the vaccines, and and the one thing you know. I'm think, I was thinking about writing a stack or, or writing some kind of Twitter thread on this. Like, you know, we were like, we'll get to this New York Times story that I, that I, you know, that I wrote about on the stack today and, and Dr. Paul Offit's comments. But you, you can feel, I think, that he feels burned. OK, that, you know, he feels that that if you go back and look at what he and he's a very, very, you know, uh, strong advocate for vaccines. And two years ago. He said these vaccines were perfect. That was his word. Okay, I think the actual language is they're as close to perfect as you could hope, or something like that. Now he's saying um, they shouldn't be given to anybody. No more jabs, as far as he is concerned, right now with the data that we have. So, how long is it going to take for you know not just average doctors and you know and even an average doctor is very very well trained, but but you know, academic doctors to understand that the drug companies are really not their friends. Okay, drug companies. I'm not saying that they will hurt people for money, but they really don't particularly care how well their drugs work if they're approvable. Okay, they don't. They want. They are. They are profit-driven enterprises, and when they have an approvable product, they will market it and sell it as hard as possible and downplay the side effects to the extent they legally can and sometimes more than that. And if you don't believe me, just look at the settlements and the and the lawsuits and the criminal charges in some cases that have been filed in the last 30 years. These companies are, they are rational actors. That does not mean they are ethical actors. Nor does it mean they are medical practitioners this is this is the part that i think everyone misses they they expect drug companies to be almost like the pharmaceutical professionals you know which is a that is a group of professionals who have the patient's interest in mind that is their job that is not what a pharmaceutical company has in mind right i mean you know again they're supposed to make you know they're supposed to be ethical right it used to be called the ethical pharmaceutical industry and they're supposed to be science driven and they're supposed to run the trials without a thumb on the scale and you know frankly if the drug doesn't work they're supposed to tell the regulators that you'd hope for all of that but it turns out in the real world when there's 
billions or tens of billions of dollars on a line. That is just not how it works. So I think you're talking about the can't hide reality article you wrote, correct? Uh, Let's talk about uh, it. <laughs> it could be any of them, but but you're talking about, the, yes, the one today um, about this New York yes. Times article that came out a week ago that sort of nobody noticed because the Times buried it. Because I think because, you know, I don't know that they were expecting to get the responses that they did from very, you know, there's this group of sort of doctors, you know, I could name them all. If you call them, you can sort of reliably, you know, know what they're going to say or think you know what they're going to say about, should I get another booster? And I think the reporter who wrote this was expecting that the answer would be yes, you know, definitely if you're, you know, over 65, it's time for another booster. Look at what Canada is doing. Look at what the UK is doing. How come the US hasn't done this yet? And in fact, they got a very different response. Um, you know, a, a doctor named Celine Gounder, who has been very, very pro vaccine and just a few months ago said that everybody over 50 should get another booster. She basically said she didn't think anybody who wasn't in a nursing home or immunocompromised. And she doesn't mean immunocompromised like, oh, you know, I have asthma or something. You know, she means like, she means I believe. Chemo. And I, 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 I should say, especially like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting chemo right now, right? I mean, I think that's how she's yeah. using yeah. that term. Yes, um, that's so, correct. So that's she's, what that means. she's talking, right? She's talking about a very narrow group of people. So, uh, so she yeah. said that. And then Offit, as I said, went further. Offit said, you know, nobody right now should be getting these. And he used the term biological agent, which is a term that I would use for these. That's what these are. They're not vaccines. I wouldn't even call them, you know, shots or jabs at this point. They are mRNA, which is a very powerful biological agent. And it is just very striking that, uh, you know, that a guy who is enormously pro-vaccine, who invented a vaccine, he invented the, or, you know, helped bring to market and invented the rotavirus, one of the rotavirus vaccines, um, you know, and two years ago said these were perfect is now saying this. So that that's what I, you know, that's what I wrote about today. That's sort of what I, you know, what I do in the Substack. Um, you know, I do some original reporting in the sense of I read a lot of papers and I look for patterns and stuff like that. You know, most of these people probably will not talk to me. You know, even if I if I picked up the phone and sometimes I email them and try to get them to talk to me, mostly they won't or don't respond because they, you know, they know who I am and they know that I've been very anti mRNA. But so I'm looking for stuff like that where I can see, you know. Offit said this, and wow, that is very different than what he said a few, uh, you know, because I've now been really it, living this for three years, so I know who says what. It, it, it's easy, you know, you, it's people, it's doctors once again finally applying their clinical judgment. And you notice that a lot of these people are adult medical doctors. One of the things I learned during the pandemic is that many of our public health officers are pediatricians. Uh, and they do not, they are not trained to make decisions around adult medicine. In fact, I talked to Peter Hotez, nice guy, good guy. We agreed on most things, but he went w w just completely off the rail as it pertained to long COVID and the potential neurological effects. And I thought, with any serious illness in your old person, you get neurological effects. It's just the way it's just, and you can get brain shrinkage from every serious, and then they come back, then they do fine. He has, doesn't have that experience. To him, it's like, that's going to happen to me, and I'm going to get sick and lose my, get him to get Alzheimer's. Now, there may still yet be some really serious neurological long term. I don't want to speak with, with absolute sort of hubris on this, but the fact is, he's just not trained to make those sorts of decisions. Celine Gounder is. Celine Gounder is an adult infectious disease doctor. And I, I, I've been saying for quite some time, which is you have a mild illness what is the risk reward i understand after age 65 it makes perfect sense to me although i've stopped i've stopped continuing to booster my patients because they've all had covid they've all had three or four vaccines and they the ones that have gotten sick in spite of that have responded well to paxlovid so right. that's enough we, we're, we've gone far enough and and presumably as the natural immunity continues to accumulate it'll be maybe milder yet going down the down the road but younger people where it's crazy mild i don't understand the risk reward why push so hard why push a 14 year old to get this where's that coming from I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, most of uh, most of other industrialized countries, uh, certainly all over Europe, they've basically stopped recommending these vaccines, not just for people under 18. You know, they, they've really stopped in a number of countries under 50. And some of the Nordic countries, yeah. I think, are up to 65 now. So, you know, yeah. why the U.S. The U.S. is now an outlier in, in, in pushing these and whether it's because you know, they were sort of invented here. I mean, look, Germany, obviously, BioNTech, but the NIH played a huge role in this. 
whether it's because um, you know the, the the Democratic policy establishment just cannot admit you know it's time to lay off. I mean, look, we have this ridiculous requirement still that you have to be vaccinated to enter the country. Uh, you know, if you're not a U.S. Crazy. citizen, almost no other place in the world has that, and it's completely wrong and unfair at this point. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, the one good thing I'll say, Dr. Drew, is that it's clear these will never be mandated for school children. That that is that is over. And um, you know, I think we we may have talked about that you know a year ago. But fortunately, even in a place like California, even in New York, even in the super blue states, that is off the table. So that is good. We, we I mean, got I, we got very question. close. They we did got very push. close Newsom here. I, I, and, and I I still don't believe it's off the table the way they behave here. But go ahead, ask me a question. So, so, I mean, when you talk, do you think other doctors, you know, sort of now feel the way you do about, you know, I'm not going to recommend this to my adult patients, uh, you know, the, the, the basically there's going to be very few more mRNAs given to people at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's it. And that's why they're putting the price at such a high, they claim that's the reason for raising their price, which seems contrary to economic theory, but okay. <laughs> Uh, that's what they decided to do, um, and, and and I think I think Covaxin is going to come along too, and I think that's going to be if you're going to take a vaccine, I'm going to start talking to patients about that one if it's available. That's true. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I, I got COVID a, a few weeks ago. I may have had it before, but this is the first time I knew I had it. Um, but if I ever get vaccinated, it will be with one of the inactivated virus uh, vaccines because yeah. Um, well, of you course, know, if, I, if you I took the, I took. I took J and J and had a terrible reaction. So, so be careful what you wish for. So, yeah, no, I. There, um, that's um, my reaction. I, I developed a, a black eye spontaneously in the oh, middle of the wow. night, and that's the that, that is the presenting feature of the consumptive coagulopathy associated with transverse sinus thrombosis. So I thought, uh oh, wow. here we go. The only male to get it, but it never went beyond wow. just the uh, that What's symptom. Yeah. Well, you're you're lucky. You're you know you're not female, right? Who knows? Maybe it would have. Yeah. Yeah. So you were, I interrupted you. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I, I mean, I just that one of the interesting things that, you know, that has happened in the last few months that again, the, you know, the, the media is still, you know, unwilling to admit how badly the vaccines have worked. Um, you know, so China, right, China had, uh, you know, obviously, the, you know, in 2020, uh, the epidemic began there, they locked down hard, they really eliminated COVID. I mean, you can you can say that we don't know, but they appeared to have, a, you know, largely eliminated the outbreaks that came and went. They vaccinated not with the mRNAs. They refused to vaccinate with the mRNAs. They used Covaxin. They used their own homegrown inactivated virus vaccines. And then, you know, flash forward to, uh, to, to you know, late fall of last year, and they, um, you know, they, they, the economy, the Chinese economy is suffering. They, you know, they, they realize they can't lock down anymore. They need to, they need to stop. You know, there's actual protests in the streets, very, very rare for China. So basically, in a matter of days, they end any COVID restrictions. And I don't know if you remember, but there were a lot of people on Twitter and in places like The Economist and, uh, you know, uh, uh, New York Times had an, an op-ed in January. You know, China is headed for disaster. There's, a, you know, they have such a large population, elderly population. They have an inadequate hospital system and they they haven't used our miracle vaccines. And lo and behold, it looks like, you know, China had basically about four bad weeks in, you know, sort of early December through early January. And, and there were definitely deaths. I mean, they definitely, you know, uh, I don't know whether they lost a million people. Remember, it's a billion and a half people, including a lot of really elderly people. But China was in no way societally impacted. Right. And now they appear to be yeah. completely done. Right. So so they used the quote unquote wrong vaccine. They ended it all at once. And because Omicron is relatively mild, they didn't you know, I mean, it, it's hard to see that that anything really bad happened. And so, I mean, you know, if the meanwhile, countries like Australia and Thailand, or, sorry, I'm sorry, and Taiwan and a lot of Europe. They, they're struggling with sort of ongoing excess mortality that's that's gone on sort of month after month after month. Uh, and nobody really has any good explanation for this. And to me, you have to ask the question of whether the mRNAs are causing this. Now, the key on this is that it's not like they have 50% extra deaths. They're having sort of 8 to 
extra week after week, month after month. And it's, and it's mostly in elderly people. It's in the same people who die of COVID. And so what is driving that? I mean, we really should answer that question. In the U.S., it's more complicated. It's in the U.S., we have some of those extra deaths, but we also had you know, more COVID deaths. And we also have this terrible problem with opioid deaths that is, that is inflating our death statistics in younger people too. Europe doesn't have that. You know, a place like Taiwan certainly doesn't have that. So you can more clearly see um, you know, that, that this is a bubble that appears to be, I mean, to my mind, the first likely cause is vaccines. Um, so I, you know, I, I think we why, need to look at that. Why is it? One will. Why isn't it? I mean, we're not, the excess mortality was not that much worse during the pandemic. Why isn't there the same urgency to address this excess mortality now? Yeah, you got, I, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, it's insane because they don't know they, you it's know insane. you don't want they, the people in charge don't want to find the answer i mean that that you gotta you gotta think that's that's the most likely reason well one of the one of the problems i have is with the medical literature I, i'm getting very confused by it at least the american medical literature which i've leaned on my entire career i mean i read it read it i read it read it uh, three different magazines on a weekly basis and now I see what looks like a campaign to put all the excess deaths into a, some sort of COVID box. Like it's there, there's sort of these waves of, of articles coming out to, and, it, and it doesn't fit the clinical pictures. But what, what, and, what is, and then by the same token, I, it's particularly confusing to me when it comes to pregnancy because there's these horrible statistics around pregnancy and stillbirths and you know spontaneous abortions and nothing but rosy data on the vaccine during pregnancy also doesn't fit the clinical picture w what's going on i mean you know what is going on that's an excellent question i another thing that is happening that's clearly happening is that you know births you know and look there's been a long-term trend in the west and in wealthier societies towards fewer kids but in a country like yeah. britain um, you know, births have like fallen off a cliff in the last in the last 18 months. You know, they're down 10 to 15 percent. And that's true in a lot of, you know, a lot of Western countries where the mRNAs were used heavily, not all of them, but, you know, a lot of them. And so uh, and, and if you look at the timing, it's suspicious, too, because in some countries you can really pin it to about nine months after the mRNAs began. Um, and, you know, I, I don't actually see and I got I made you talk about a mistake. Uh, the most recent mistake I've made that was a serious error, which I, you know, just, it just, it just was a mistake. Um, Singapore seemed to have some data showing that stillbirths were way up in Singapore following uh, vaccines. And it turned out that they'd actually changed the definition of stillbirth from 28 weeks to 22 weeks. Um, and that was what had led to this. So it was a data artifact. And they didn't mm -hmm. even, they didn't footnote this anywhere. They, so, so you had to sort of figure this out independently and I didn't do it, I failed. So I don't mm -hmm. necessarily see huge risk from the vaccine in pregnancy, but what I do see is the live births going down. And there is this study from last year, an Israeli study, a pretty good study showing that sperm counts post-vaccine drop significantly. And so, I mean, you see that story, okay? Shouldn't, shouldn't you know, 10 really good, um, you know, fertility doctors be doing a study and be looking at sperm that they have banked from people pre-vaccine, post-vaccine? Shouldn't we be figuring out whether this is real or not? So you see the study and then you see no follow-up, right? And you see, you know, there were two papers that came out in January and uh, 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 January of this year and in in December 2022, so two papers in a matter of weeks that came out showing this class switch to IgG4 antibodies in people who'd gotten right. at least two or three doses of the mRNAs. And we know IgG4, that is sort of the allergy antibody, right? That's not necessarily the antibody you want to have to a replicating virus in your body. And, you know, this, is, this seems like a big deal to me. And there's been speculation that this sort of could explain why people who've been vaccinated you know, yes, they when they get Omicron, for the most part, they you know they, they eventually they shock it, and especially if they take Paxlovid, they you know they don't die, they don't necessarily get that sick, but it takes them a long time, and then they get it again. You know, why is that? Well, I mean, you can make a pretty good case that it has something to do with this class switch. I'm not saying it's proven in any way. I'm just saying there's a case. Yeah. Shouldn't that be something that the FDA and the CDC and you know and Pfizer itself? are publicly discussing and saying, we're going to investigate this. 
And the answer I would think is yes, but it's not happening. And it's confusing to me. Uh, and I, I'm hearing that the ability to get more uh, range of studies published is improving. That you know, during the pandemic, there was a, there was like a shutdown on really the the usual conversation in the medical literature. It was just all one direction. And now it it it's I'm hearing that it's less. I just am not seeing it. And it and as always, when the literature doesn't fit my clinical experience, that that's when I get a little worry that the, that whatever's going on in the literature is not reflecting what's actually the reality. I mean, you know, I hear from a lot of doctors. Now, there are a lot of doctors. And, you know, even if I hear from, I don't know how many, you know, dozens in the, you know, over the course of a, a month or, you know, that's a tiny number of the overall number of doctors, obviously, but yeah. I still hear from them. And they say to me, you know, I feel constrained at what I can say at work. You know, not forget forget oh, disciplinary for sure. action. Oh, for sure. I just don't oh, for sure. talk honestly about this. And, you know, yeah. and, and sometimes, you know, I hear from patients too who say, you know, my doctor said to me, yeah, this is definitely the vaccine. You know, do well, are we going to file, you know, a virus report? No, you know, let's just, let's just be done with it. And, you know, most of the time that's what happens. And so, I mean, it's interesting when you do look at case reports and, you, you know, there are case reports about, uh, uh, there's a, you know, there's a fair bit of autoimmune a disease that seems to follow these vaccines. And so, you know, whether that's a, you know, or, or, or in some cases, flare ups of something like herpes or, or, you know, or shingles, or, you know, so, so you see these, you know, sort of immune reactions. Um, a lot of that literature comes out of other countries. You know, you, for example, Japan, um, I think, it, you know, tends to be a little bit more cautious about vaccines. So you see Japanese doctors writing about this. And fortunately, you know, a lot of them are writing in English, uh, you know, it, you know, and it's sort of like, it's small journals. It's not the New England Journal of Medicine, but but they're real case reports. They're real doctors reporting what they really see. And it seems like in the United States, there's been a very strong reluctance to do that. Alex, got to take a little break here. Alex Berenson, I got a bunch of other stuff I want to talk about when I get you back here. So I hope you'll be uh, put up with me. I've just got so many different things on my mind right now. So we'll be back with more Alex Berenson right after this. Over the last few months, no doubt you've heard a lot about spike protein, certainly on this program. The reality is once lockdowns are well behind us, we will likely still be dealing with the effects of COVID and potentially the COVID-19 vaccines. Therefore, the spike protein may prove to be an important part of our story. With that in mind, I want to introduce you to the wellness company's spike support formula. Whether you've been vaccinated or not, spike protein may be something you have become concerned about. The good news is that there's some interesting research on how to potentially deal with it. Studies have suggested that natokinase and dandelion root are showing some potential in protecting you and your family. Our friend Dr. Peter McCullough and the team at the Wellness Company have the only product on the market that contains both natokinase and dandelion root. In addition to the natokinase and the dandelion root, the Wellness Company's spike support formula also includes natural antioxidant ingredients such as black sativa extract green tea and iris sea moss all thought to help boost immune health go to twc.health slash drew to order today use code drew at checkout for 10 percent off today i think you know how much susan and i love our genucel skincare and how easy it is to try our one-of-a-kind customer packages bundled with our favorite products susan realized the other day that one of our kids stole some of our deep correcting serum from our stash if you will we had no idea that the lactic and hyaluronic acid combo is so great for adult acne dark marks and scars so not only are susan and i hooked on these products but apparently somebody else in our family is too somebody's ripping it off i know i'm a snob about the products i use on my face everybody knows it every time i go to the dermatologist's office they're just rows and rows of different creams retinols vitamin c cream under eye cream night creams scrubs and then when i get to the counter they're overpriced all kinds of products that you can all find at genucel.com i've fallen in love with this product at a fraction of the price. I've been using Genucel for six months now, 
and I'm very impressed. Great skin care is important at any age, and we love how amazing the results are. Thank you to Genucel. Plus, now you can find your very own bundle based on your unique skin care needs using cutting-edge AI skin care technology. You can get a full skin analysis instantly and create a skin care regimen tailored towards your needs. Visit genucel.com slash Drew to check out our favorites and enter that promo code Drew, D-R-E-W, at checkout for added savings. All orders include free shipping and a free mineral mask. Order now. Go to genucel.com slash Drew. That is genucel, G-E-N-U-C-E-L, genucel.com slash Drew. Buy gold and get a free save to store it in. You heard right. On qualifying purchases from Birch Gold Group, now through March 31st, they will ship you a free safe directly to your door. Here's the deal. The Fed keeps raising rates because it is the only tool they have to keep inflation under control. But it isn't working. You can't spend your way out of inflation. And you've seen the impact on the stock market. You've seen the impact on your savings. Hedge inflation by owning gold. Whether physical gold and silver in your safe or through an IRA in precious metals where you can hold real gold and silver in tax-sheltered retirement accounts. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers. Visit birchgold.com slash Drew for your free info kit on gold and to claim eligibility for your free home safe by March 31st on qualifying purchases. Again, visit B-I-R-C-H Gold, birchgold.com slash D-R-E-W. Let's bring Alex Berenson back up here. Alex, somebody at the beginning of the show on our Restream thread Wanted me to ask about your interaction with Robert Malone. I don't. I didn't hear it. I didn't read it. Did something happen there with Dr. Malone? Oh, wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. We, we don't have you. Hold on. Oh, we, we lost yes. you down for a second. There, there you are. You're back. You're back. You're back. You're back. You're back. Uh, yeah, Mal I mean, so I, I said that I didn't think Malone uh, was helping anybody. I think it was about ivermectin. I said I didn't think he was helping anybody by, you know, sort of pushing ivermectin. I don't think ivermectin works very well. Um, and certainly now that we have Paxlovid, that's very, very effective, you know, even even though, you, look, it may be useless in people who are under 65 because they're at such low risk. But for people who are at real risk from, you know, from COVID, Paxlovid is a useful medicine. I think that's been demonstrated whether you're yep. vaccinated or not. For sure. There's stronger evidence for sure. people who are unvaccinated, but there's real evidence in vaccinated people too. So, you know, I, I think under those circumstances, giving people what's basically a placebo is not, you know, I, I would look, I'm not an MD. I don't have the right to prescribe anything, but I wouldn't do that. Um, and Malone never forgets a slight um, and, and he never forgets a disagreement. <laughs> and uh, he didn't like that. And he's still I mean, this was over a year ago um, and he's still talking about it. He, he tweeted about it the other day uh, again. So, you know, yeah, I, yeah. Malone, I, I, I can't look, I. I have other things to worry about. I am on the verge of filing, and we, you know, we haven't talked about this at all. But I'm on the verge of firing this, filing this lawsuit against, you know, the president and you know a couple of White House advisors, and against Scott Gottlieb at Pfizer, and against Albert Borla at Pfizer. You know, the CEO of Pfizer, um, Scott Gottlieb, is a board member of Pfizer for their, you know, their their efforts to get me deplatformed from Twitter to get Twitter to censor me back in 2001. It's a very serious lawsuit. It's going to be a federal lawsuit. We're going to, I think we have a real chance. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't do these things for fun. I do them because I think, I, I think, I think there's a very important first amendment case here. And I also think we have a real chance to win just as we did when I sued Twitter uh, you know, in December, 2021, which a lot of people mocked me for. And, you know, the, the joke, was ultimately on Twitter. This was pre Elon Twitter when, uh, you know, a federal judge said the case should move forward, surviving the motion to dismiss. And then Twitter had to, you know, ultimately they settled with me and put me back on again, all pre Musk had nothing to do with Elon. And so, so, you know, what, what, what Robert Malone wants to say about me is irrelevant to me. What's relevant to right, me. Fair enough. You know, we have bigger issues. Well, but let's, I don't let's think go to the, the Twitter a very useful drug at this point i i don't really either i but i don't you know to me the, the the one phenomenon again the one area that has been ruptured in this is the the doctor patient relationship and nobody should be second guessing or looking at what a doctor and a patient do together that should be between the two of them and that's it if joe rogan's doctor wants to give him some ivermectin it's none of our fucking business 
And by the way, they focused on that, and he did some other weird stuff that was kind of interesting too. He gave him uh, the MD, uh, uh, in what's the, what's the word I'm looking for the oh, NAC. NAD infusion. They gave him NAD, gave him an NAD infusion. They gave the monoclonal amp, but they did some really interesting things. That was between the two of them, it had nothing to do with anybody else than the two of them. And the fact that people felt a privilege to step in and start commenting on it was disgusting to me. So that. That's one thing about that. So if they want to use it, fine. But you're right. Paxlovid, I will tell you, having prescribed all these things, Paxlovid, people are better in two days, period. <laughs> they are just better fast. And that now, what's weird, again, back to the medical literature, there was a big study that just came out that proved there's no such thing as rebound. Well, well then what am I seeing? What, what is this thing I'm seeing when people end up with these bronchial symptoms for two weeks, five days after they finish their, their Paxlovid course? And, it, people, and they, the um, science world wants to go, oh, it's that cytokine again. No, this has nothing to do with cytokine activation. This is the airway inflammation that is associated with Omicron. It comes back. I, I've seen it and seen it and seen it. Better than the acute illness. I'm glad I prescribed the Paxlovid, but it makes me sort of a little more cautious with Paxlovid sometimes. See, I mean, and this is where you're the fact that you really, you know, you're you're not somebody, you're not, you're not seeing one patient a week. Like you clearly see a lot of patients. So you really can bring your clinical experience in here. And, you know, uh, it's one thing, uh, by the way, I, I, Look, I totally agree with you about the clinician's privilege, right? You have trained all these years. You Now you practice, you see all these patients, unless you're doing something really harmful, it, you know, in which case a medical board needs to step in. You know, if you're, if you're trading there's opioids a system. for- There's a system for that. Yeah, there's a system That's for right. that. There's, there's a system but, in place. You, yeah. You are, it's the art of medicine. You're entitled to some leeway. And so I, I I absolutely agree with that, and and I am very conscious that I'm not a doctor. When I when when I wasn't a parent, I always respected parents. I really did. And 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 now that I am a parent, you know, if you don't have kids, don't tell me how to parent. You don't know the first thing about it, okay? And I sort of feel yeah. that way about medicine. As a non physician, yeah. I am very respectful of physicians' decisions. And if and in general. You know, again, like when when there was no Paxlovid for people to prescribe ivermectin, if they thought they had good reasons to do it, good. Now that the literature is so strong on Paxlovid, I don't see much reason to prescribe ivermectin. But yeah, I don't I, also I, don't I think agree. that as a non-physician, it's my role to get really mad about it. Right. Nor nor is it for me to tell other phys other doctor patient units to to how they should function. But it, it's interesting that in this through this pandemic, we had people with over-the-top extreme opinions about medication that they had learned how to pronounce three days prior. And suddenly they had Im incredibly powerful opinions about a medication that I've been prescribing for 30 years that they just learned how to pronounce. Not that they know anything about it, they just learned how to pronounce the word. Uh, it's just, this was an uncanny time. But let's go back around to that that sort of insanity. We, we, we're we talking about the evangelical physicians, and, and people think I'm talking about religious evangelism. I'm just talking about evangelism, not religious evangelism. You can evangelize on any topic. And physicians, when they become evangelical, they become dangerous. And we had the, we were talking about how the the pandemic group the the epidemiologists and whatnot seem to have either a desire to be a hero with the advent of a pandemic which is inevitable or a phobia about the possibility of a pandemic and they absolutely are perfectionistic in terms of um, their attempts to avoid it there's another part of this though that i've learned i've learned a couple of really interesting things through talking to lots of people which is that there is a pan there's sort of a pandemic ink there's a pandemic industry out there. There's a world of professionals that are, are hammers waiting to find that nail to start hammering on it. And, and uh, corona, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, had an uncanny sort of appeal to that pandemic ink group who had just been rehearsing, dealing with exactly this, exactly, well, let's call it the nail that they needed to hammer. And that, to me, is a really interesting part of this story that I did not know. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, this really dates back uh, to really about 2000, right? So, um, you know, uh, a guy named D.A. Henderson, who I think, you know, unfortunately, he's dead now. He died in 2016. But uh, by all accounts, uh, you know, a great guy, 
and really was as responsible for anybody for the final eradication of smallpox. And, uh, you know, sort of engaged in this campaign to get the U.S. and what was then the Soviet Union to eliminate the last of their smallpox. Well, in, you know, in the 90s, the U.S. military came to him and said, by the way, they, you know, the, the Russians have been, they've been manufacturing smallpox by the ton, you know, in Siberia. Well, you thought there was none left. And he was very upset. And, you know, by the way, they, they're playing with Ebola and they're, you know, seeing, they're seeing if they can put them together and there's anthrax by the, you know, by the, by the pound being made. And, you know, so, so, so he became very concerned about the threat of bioterror. And, uh, and, you know, and he was very respected, uh, you know, on, on Capitol Hill and, and, and then at the Pentagon because of his experience, uh, you know, with smallpox and in the public health community. And so, and then 2001, you know, the, the, the attacks on the Twin Towers and then an, the anthrax attacks, which initially were thought to be, uh, you know, the work of, of Muslim terrorists, although they ultimately, you know, it's almost certain uh, that, you know, an American uh, biodefense scientist carried them out. Um, uh, and so that led to this huge increase in spending um, uh, for, you know, on bioterror research and bioterror defense research. And, you know, sort of this whole generation of scientists um, realized that there was money here. And, 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 and again, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the scientists you're, or the physicians you're talking about who the pain and the fifth vital sign, well, we're going to protect the world from this. Um, and the then, same thing. you know, same thing, same thing. And, uh, and unfortunately, so, you know, or fortunately, in some ways, it turns out that, you know, biological weapons are actually terrible weapons. You can't control them um, for the same cost, you know, of, of a big lab. You could, you know, you could put a thousand people out with AK-47s and do inestimable damage, or you could make a nuke and really blow up the world. And so, you know, and by the way, chemical weapons are actually quite cheap and quite awful. So there really isn't a great role for biological weapons. You know, the only only the only people who can really make them work are states. And if you're a state that's powerful enough to use them, you're going to have nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons as a deterrent, you know, so if we say to the Soviets, okay, you can start with the smallpox, we're just going to, you know, we're going to drop a 50 megaton on Moscow. That actually works as a deterrent, right? So there's really not a great role in war for biological weapons. I, you know, you can always try to find an argument for them, but it's not a good role. And so within a few years, you know, remember, we went into a, Iraq looking for these labs. There were no real labs. It became clear that Al Qaeda really had not gotten anywhere with any of this stuff. You know, the, 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 the truth about these, their uselessness as weapons became pretty clear to people. And so all these guys needed something to do, and they found it in the emerging infectious disease space. Right. So the theory of emerging infectious diseases, even though there have been human beings on this planet for, you know, a million years and we've been all, you know, we've been in every cave that's ever existed, that somehow climate change is going to, you know, and, and the fact that there's more, you know, there's now some Chinese miners in some cave in Yunnan mean that there's some terrible bug out there just waiting to be discovered. Even though, frankly, like before, you know, SARS, yeah, SARS killed some people, but it actually wasn't very infectious. before. Uh, before COVID, we hadn't had a real respiratory virus epidemic, a serious one in a century, right? And, and, and mm -hmm. so, yes, we had the flu and the flu kills some older people, but I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the kind of epidemic that COVID was, much less the Spanish flu. And so, so the, but these guys insisted that it was out there, that we just needed to go to enough caves and we would find this d terrible disease X that had exactly the right mix of infectivity and virulence and was going to kill us all. And guess what? They couldn't find it. So then the next thing they did was say, okay, just give us a chance to play with it in a lab, you know, and we'll, we'll make it bad. We'll show you which one's going to get bad. Um, and I mean, this, this really was the logic, gain of function research. We need to figure out what could happen. And by the way, somebody made an extraordinary point that I hadn't considered until, uh, until very recently, which is gain of function research even if it works, is useless because there's in the wild, there's so many, you know, trillions of ways that these viruses can combine that no matter how many, you know, uh, you, uh, you know um, runs through ferrets you try or how many theoretical, um, you know, changes you make to the genome of some bat virus you got uh, to try to make it more virulent, you're not going to find what happens in the wild. 
right? Because you just, you just, I mean, the argument is even let's say COVID is natural, which I don't think it was, but if it's natural, we did a terrible job predicting it for, you know, the last decade right. we've been trying to predict it, we failed. So, so the, so the argument is basically gain of function is all downside, no upside. Even if it works, it doesn't work because it doesn't actually tell you where the next epidemic is coming from. But guess what? There was hundreds of really, if not billions of dollars uh, available from places like the Gates Foundation and, you know, and the U.S. government and WHO to, you know, to try to look at inf emerging infectious diseases. And all these guys needed something to do. And this is what they did. It's interesting, you know, back to the lockdown uh, and, you know, why we locked down, which is so mysterious. I uh, heard a few more pieces of the puzzle, which was essentially that it was Pandemic Inc. Some of those folks were sort of persuaded by the Chinese, their Chinese counterparts, who, by the way, sat side by side with them at their rehearsals of the pandemic that they had completely eliminated COVID in China. It was, the graph went up and then flat, which is totally ridiculous, but they, our scientists bought that. And, but it really wasn't until uh, Italy locked down, apparently that the, the lockdown caught wind. And the, one of the politicians in Lombardy who made, who actualized the, the, the who brought the lockdown to that region, pu published a book before the pandemic was over about what he was doing. And he had apparently in this book expresses that it, this really wasn't about controlling COVID. He was a Sinophile and it was about bringing totalitarian policies yeah. to Italy. This was his opportunity to do that. They took the book off the market. It was such an embarrassment, but that, that's the reason that lockdown came to the Western you know, uh, region. And then everybody followed that just out of panic. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, Italy was the first Western country. I go into this in pandemia, you know, and um, I mean, you know, it, it, there was this there was this fear in northern Italy. I mean, the 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 other side of this, I would say, is that I think there were some Western scientists who were overly afraid of covid because although they would not admit it publicly then or now, they thought it had come out of a lab and they thought it had been sort of manipulated in a way that would make it very dangerous. Um, and, you know, as I joked once in some tweet that probably earned me, you know, the usual amount of hate, uh, you know, two years ago, it was just another rushed, failed Chinese stolen product. It didn't it didn't it didn't work that well as a weapon. of I'm certainly as a weapon of war. Um, it's a, but, you know, they were afraid of that, I think. And so that was what helped lead to these lockdowns. And then you're right. I mean, you can look at people on the left, not just in Italy, but in the U.S. saying, well, this is going to get us universal basis game come. This is going to, you know, this is going to move us to a socialist paradise. Nobody's going to be able to work. The government's going to have to step in in an unprecedented way, which, you know, which it did for a while. And we're going to all have to get comfortable with a lot more government intervention in our lives. And, you know, I, I don't know if Ron DeSantis hadn't been around, if, you know, if Andrew Gillum hadn't been caught smoking crack with a male prostitute uh, in 2017, no joke, or whenever that was. And, and DeSantis hadn't won, um, uh, maybe that would have happened. I mean, instead, Florida sort of refused to lock down. I mean, DeSantis, to me, is a real hero in all of this. And you can still see, you know, Vanity Fair took a, you know, they tried to take, I'm going to write a stack about this in the next day or two. They, you know, they tried to take him down uh, yesterday or uh, a few days ago. And and there's a guy named Joseph Ladopo, who um, who you should have on. He's the Florida Surgeon General. He's a really smart, had interesting him. guy. Had him. I, uh, oh, guy. you've had him, great so you guy. know him. Great guy. And, he, you know, and he stands for what's right, you know, what he believes, certainly. Um, but, you know, the Vanity Fair wrote this long article about how, you know, how terrible DeSantis is and what an anti-vaxxer is and how he's not he's not pushing pediatric vaccines. And you know what they failed to say? Again, as we talked about a few minutes ago, most of Europe has completely ended uh, you know, a pediatric vac COVID vaccine. So you want to get on DeSantis? You want to pretend he's the one who's out of step? No. It's the it's the United States, you know, it's the CDC that's out of step with where the world is on this. But I do I do think I mean, you're right. The story of the lockdowns, how much of it was panic, how much of it was this sort of concerted effort to see if we could push boundaries and try something new here. How much of it was just having the ability that, you know, these you know sort of rich, rich uh, technology workers could all work from home and get 
food delivered and they just didn't care anymore. Look, I, I was not one of those people. I, I, I wanted to be out and, and not only wanted, I didn't, you know, I remember lining up at a Walmart at 6 a.m., uh, uh, you know, in like early mm. April of 2020 and thinking like, is this really how we're going to live? But, you know, there were people who who weren't lining up at Walmarts, who were getting their food delivered, who were perfectly happy to lock down forever. So strange. I mean, social isolation is so destructive for human beings. It's absolutely the worst. Uh, why, um, why do you think we don't know what happened to Damar Hamlin yet? Do you have a theory about that? <laughs> I mean, you know, I think once again, people don't want it. It's really funny you mentioned it because I was just thinking we're coming up on three months. I think it was January 3rd. And, um, you know, look, the, the NFL, I mean, you know, they have protocols for concussion that are, you know, pages and pages long that people have been fighting about for years. This is a guy who practically dropped dead. Thank God, you know, they revived him, but he practically dropped dead on the field and nobody seems to have a question about it. And, you know, I have to say these, the, the vaccine companies are so lucky in their enemies because you get people like this idiot Stu Peters and these other, you know, sort of super right wing crazies who, who go on about how DeMar Hamlin actually died and it's a body double and the tattoos don't match. And all <laughs> That's this ridiculous. And, I'm serious <laughs> though. and so, like, so yeah. those people, unfortunately, Dr. Drew, like they, they're, they're, you know, they're stink wafts over to me and to you and to people who are trying to ask serious questions about this. And there is a serious question about what happened to him. And more importantly, why there's been no real discussion of it since then. But because, you know, it's like, oh, the anti-vaxxers say Damar Hamlin got killed and actually is. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying he did. He did have some serious cardiac event in front of, you know, tens of millions of people and no one has talked about it. And let's say it was due to COVID, some sort of post-COVID phenomenon. What do we do to screen the other players for it or other child athletes or to college football athletes? It, this is an extreme, if this is something related to this infectious disease, we need to, it's an emergency before we allow people out there to play tackle football again, or even back. I mean, what are we doing? And if it's from something else, if it's vaccine or COVID plus vaccine, how do you screen for that? And how are we going to make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else as opposed to a veil of silence? That is just shocking to me. Yep. Uh, totally. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you remember, but when, when it was, you know, in, in the summer of 2020, there was this theory based on a terrible study, I think out of the university of Michigan, um, there may have been two, there may have been one in the U S and one in Germany that seemed to show that, you know, post COVID, even healthy athletes were having all this heart trouble. It was completely bogus, the study, but, and then there was this one guy, I think he was a Boston Red Sox reliever who got myocarditis or, or had some, some heart issue following COVID. And it didn't even, it didn't even last that long, but as a result, there were, you know, there was discussion of the NFL can't play. College football is going to have to cancel its seasons. There were predictions that, you know, any number of college athletes will drop dead if we force them to play. None of it was true. None of, you know, the COVID's risks to healthy athletes are, you know, very, very, very low. And yes, maybe you can have an idiosyncratic case of myocarditis, but it's, you know, it's extraordinarily rare. And it's, you know, in, in younger people, that's not true of the vaccines. But when that was happening in 2020, there was tremendous discussion of what we were going to do. You're exactly right. Now we have this known risk of myocarditis in young people. And, and, and we've had cases of young athletes, you know, not just tomorrow, but, you know, there have been cases of high school athletes who've died. And obviously that can happen. It happened in the pre-COVID, the pre-vaccine era too. But it is just, it's not, we're not allowed to discuss it. Every, every NFL team has an MRI. What, what uh, you can screen for myocarditis with MRI. Maybe they should all, I mean, it's a little, there's a lot of false positives. So it's going to end up with a bunch of people not playing who would otherwise, you know, maybe not be need to be pulled out, but shouldn't we at least be talking about uh, screening everyone with MR? I, I don't know. Well, I mean, and, and, and you know, and let's, let's, why aren't they trying to elucidate the mechanisms by which the mRNAs can cause yeah. myocarditis, right? So is it, is it the yeah. spike? You know, is your body continuing to produce a spike or is it some kind of autoimmune reaction? 
Or is it, you know, maybe just something, you know, there's been this theory that if you were improperly injected, you know, somehow you got you got the vaccine in your capillaries, it wound up in your blood, it wasn't localized in the muscle cells around, you know, of the deltoid. Let's figure out the answer instead of pretending the problem isn't real. There's another theory flying around lately, which is that the 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 volume of uh, vaccine being produced is creating a, in a, a sort of abnormal distribution of the uh, lipid nanoparticles. And so some are getting big doses, some are getting small doses, and that might have something to do with it. it it's a, it's a it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, which, which is my batch. Yeah. I've never really, I, I haven't really looked at that at all. It strikes me as, as extremely unlikely given the manufacturing processes here, but, but honestly, I, I, I don't know enough to know whether that's at all plausible. Well, I, I can only say that I've spoken to a manufacturing expert who pointed out some of the very, very serious flaws in the manufacturing standards and the lack of standards to which they're being held because of the emergency use authorization. Now, I have known nothing about this. I'm just talking to people, listening to people, but she was very compelling, very compelling. And mm -hmm. she was de definitely concerned about the manufacturing practices. Uh, I mean, I, right, the, the correct answer to all of this is we're going to look at it, right? Not, it's not real yeah, right, when you're an anti right. if you right. talk about it. Right, right, we're going we're gonna to look at, we should examine these things, we examine excess deaths, examine where the virus go, the, uh, the lipid nanoparticles go, we'll examine the causes of myocarditis, we'll talk about what could happen to an NFL player and what happened to them tomorrow. I mean, the fact that, look, this, this is the one, and I want to talk a little about cannabis after this really quickly, but the one thing that I don't understand why people are not outraged by, they should be just beside themselves, that the government and the, the government and the, particularly in collusion with the tech have taken the position of Jack Nicholson and a few good men, which was a, which was a character that was pointed at as a, as an extreme excess of the, the, of governments and the, and the overreach and the ridiculous conservatism. You can't handle the truth and that now has become a standard of operation that's right no i mean he's a villain in that movie right he winds up in jail um uh you're you're absolutely correct i mean my my theory on this you know as again going back to psychology is look people know they can't be unvaccinated they did it most of them you know willingly or not and they don't want to think about it anymore and and again the problems if if people were dropping dead by the boatload the, you know, yeah, even many. if we didn't want to talk yeah. about it, it, right. So it's this, yeah. it's this like, right. it's like this, again, eight to 15%, mostly older people. It's something that, that is, that is demographically complicated enough that it's arguable. And so people yeah. like me, I'm, you know, I'm stuck. I'm not going to stop arguing or, 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 you know, or talking about this or trying to report it because I think it's important and because I think, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. I can get a few people to listen if I present facts, but most people just, don't want to think about COVID anymore. And that includes the vaccines, I think. And it must be include the government too, because they seem to just want to just push, <laughs> push it all away. Um, so, and it's, again, if, if they're going to stop mandating and pushing and then, okay, then don't go forget about it. But as long as they're pushing so hard, it's like, explain it to me, explain the push. But um, one thing I've noticed about your writing is that stuff that you write that you are condemned for has an uncanny way of being true, uh, being proven to be true, I should say. And your cannabis book was one of those things. Um, my daughter's got about 18 months of cannabis sobriety now, and she, uh, I had your book. I owe her, I owe her an email, went, by the way. I owe her an email. Okay, good. She, oh. she was very, I mean, like over the moon impressed. And why didn't you tell me was her, was her sort of, uh, rejoinder to me. And I was like, I, of course I told you. I told you over and over and over again. I had the book lying out forever. You didn't want to hear it. People don't still don't want to hear it. Adam was pointing out to me today in California, if a parent finds out that his high school student is smoke, would they, he, he said, look, if you took a bunch of high school parents in California, so would you rather your kids smoke pot or cigarettes? In California, they'd say pot. Would you rather your kids vape or smoke pot? They'd say pot. And, and vaping is harmless. And that's the, that's the job we've done with, uh, with this product. Yes. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the evidence is only piling up more and more. More evidence of the cardiac and cardiovascular dangers. Um, another study, now admittedly it was in monkeys, but another study that literally just came out showing, um, you know, real decreases in, in sperm count, 
Um, and, uh, you know, generally, you know, sort of the lower levels of testosterone in, in male monkeys given, you know, pretty reasonable doses of THC um, and epigenetic evidence, you know, evidence of changes, um, you know, in the sperm that were, you know, in areas, uh, you know, related to sort of brain development. So, you know, even before conception, you know, there's evidence that, that cannabis can cause sort of harmful ch changes in the brain. And so, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I do think that, I think that things are starting to change in terms of parents. I think a lot of parents have seen that this is not helpful for their kids. I think, unfortunately, that, you know, the flip side of that is that, um, you know, the, the high potency THC stuff is just so addictive. It's so hard to stop using it's wild, once you yeah. start. It's a lot different. Um, you know, it's, a lot different. it's different, right? So, so there's a, you know, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a generation of kids now who, who may even want to stop some of them and are, and are going to have a very hard time doing that. Yeah. How do you maintain your uh, enthusiasm when it, you ha hit such headwinds with truth? How do you how do you keep doing it? I, I mean, you know, I I just figure, first of all, I have a, there's a group of people who are interested in hearing what I have to say. And, you know, when people say bad things about me, look, if you want to say you got the study wrong or, you, you know, you really screwed up with that Singapore thing and stillbirth or you were so dumb three years ago when you said, you know, that, 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 that the T cell cross immunity was going to be a real big thing. Like, OK, fine. I was dumb. I was wrong. You know, and if I'm wrong too many times, people are going to stop listening to me. But when you say, you know, what, you're a grifter, you don't care whether black people are in jail. That's what it's all about for you. Or you you really don't care if old people die. You're just a ghoul and a psychopath. And this and that. I, you know what? I, that that stuff in some ways is fuel for me because it's not true. I, you know, I'm doing my best. And if you don't like what I have to say, argue with me on the facts, but don't say, you know, or you want to say my tone is sometimes nasty or, you know, or I'm overly sarcastic. Fine. But you know what? Like, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to say what I think is right and, and, and stick to the truth. And I'm going to keep doing it. And it really doesn't matter what these people say about me. Yeah, we've got to return to the argument rather than the personal attacks. It's just, it's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. We've got to figure out what we agree and disagree upon and discuss it, argue about it. I, I don't know where, why or what group has taken us so far off the rail, but ugh. Well, listen, uh, what else do you want people to know before I let you go? It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to chat. Um, you know, with you. look, the, um, you know, Unreported Truths uh, is the substack. I, um, you know, Pandemia is the book. Uh, you know, I, hopefully there will be another book soon. Um, the substack is one of the funny things about people calling me a grifter is the substack is basically free. You can sign up and you can pay, you know, $6 a month or $60 a year. But you're, I always tell people this, you're basically going to get the same product. Some stories you might get a day or two earlier if you, uh, if you pay, but almost everything else, you're almost, you're going to be able to read everything within a couple of days. So if you don't want to pay, don't they, pay. But I just, I they, just want you to read The vocabulary, the vocabulary of social media moves from one favorite word to the other. It went from grim to then it went to grifter uh no quack grim quack grifter shill those are their those are their favorite words and thank you for expanding you know, my wife's vocabulary clown. Because, clown clown but you know what that well, word the new, you know, the goes, what's a new one uh, the new one i mean this doesn't get used against us so much as authoritarian right so ron DeSantis, oh, yeah. who kept his state yeah. open who didn't you know insist that you stay home is somehow an authoritarian. Yeah. Um, you know, look, I, yeah. you, you don't have to agree. You know, he may, he may, he may play to the crowd sometimes, and I, some of the stuff with Disney or whatever may be sort of silly. But an authoritarian, he's the one who said, "Go out and live your life," right? So I, you know, uh, so um, and the other big thing that's on my agenda, really, and it will be soon. I've been promising this for a while, but it, it's going to happen. It's not going to happen in the next couple of days, only because you know I don't want to file this thing. I'm hoping somebody might actually write about it, although they probably won't. Uh, you know, certainly the Twitter lawsuit got very little attention. But I'm hoping that, you know, my effort to hold the federal government accountable and stand up for the First Amendment might get some attention. You know, there was an earlier lawsuit against Trump called Knight uh, Institute v. Trump about social media banning um, where Trump blocked mm. people from his accounts. And that got tons of attention. Mm. This lawsuit, I think, in some ways is, I mean, it's like that, only stronger. 
Um, so we'll see. But I am going to file that. And it is hopefully, look, all I can do is hope that, you know, it's going to be the Second Circuit. That's, a, you know, that's New York. That's a blue state. But I'm going to hope that they take, you know, my claim seriously and that the case moves forward. Um, uh, so that's going to be, a you know, a big deal, at least to me, when it happens. <laughs> That'll be very, I can't wait to hear how that goes. I, I, were you surprised how much Twitter was uh, manipulating things or was that, was that what you expected? I, I was, I mean, I knew about the banning. I was sort of surprised about the number of levels, the levers that they had that you couldn't see, the various shadow bans that they could sort of prevent your stuff from being promoted or, you know, they, they, you know, they were, that they, they, they had essentially four or five levels that they could do secretly. Um, they, you know, there was just sort of this handful of senior people mm -hmm at Twitter who could do, uh, you know, who could, they could apply these things to you or then they could take them away. Um, and so that, you know, that, that did surprise me. I mean, we all knew that the companies were under enormous uh, scrutiny and pressure um, from the federal government during COVID. And, you know, I, I think, I don't think, you know, I think the Biden administration in its heart of hearts would like to continue to do that. I think that they, I mean, one of the great ironies here is that I, I'm fighting the federal government, okay, and Pfizer, and you know, and, and and the media. Like, I'm one, I'm one idiot on Twitter with a few hundred thousand people, and yet I'm like the powerful voice that needs to be suppressed. Me and a hand, you know, and Robert Kennedy, whoever else. It's it's absurd. If you can't make your case when you're advertising on every, you know television show in the country for six months, if you can't make your case about vaccines because of me, then the problem is not me. It's it's the vaccines. Yeah, there you go. Well, Alex, White House uh, we, there we go. Uh, it appreciate does feel powerful. It. Hopefully, we'll see you in person one of these days out here. Or we're uh, where where do you live? Do you I, I would, to say where you live? I, I live in I live in the beautiful Hudson Valley of New York. But uh, no, I'm going to get out to okay. California, and and I'm I'm going to I'm going to crash I'm going to crash the studio. Oh, all right, if we're uh, but, or you can crash our studio in New York. Yeah, we do some stuff in New York too. Out. If you're in the city, let us let us know. So we'll do something there. All right, all right. Any any time. All right. Perfect. I don't Thanks, know how Dr. It'll look, but we'll we'll do our best. All right. Now, it'll look better than this. See you soon. All right, thanks, <laughs> it'll be dead. <laughs> uh, Susan, do you want me to take any calls or anything before I it's sign up to out? You. It's uh, up to you. Are we uh, Caleb? Are you have baby duty or? <laughs> I see a couple hands up. I need to get I you really quickly. Nap, but... I, okay. Yes, I have three He's minutes. He's got a lot of energy. Okay. Lida or Lida. At least take one call. She's connecting. Thank you all for being out there on Twitter Spaces. Again, if you come up, you're going on multiple oh. platforms. Yes, hi. Hi. Okay. I'm super excited. Okay. Um, well, not really. It's really sad. But I was wondering, do you think there's any mechanism in the vaccine that would cause a placental abruption? Not that I'm aware of. You know, the doctor, oh, okay. Dr. Ryan Cole is, you know, concerned about accumulation of spike in placenta. We had mm -hmm. Vicki Mail in here the other day who gave us no data to suggest. Her data was good. I mean, I, I don't understand why it was as good as it was, uh, right. given other things I've seen. But I, again, nothing to sort of implicate it there. Uh, well, and and placenta oh. abruption, you know, that happens. It just, ha it's a, not, a, not a rare thing. Well, right. This is why I asked. So, like, um, I had a daughter in June of 2021, and my daughter's father also was expecting a niece that July. So she's about four months behind my daughter. Mm -hmm. And when, um, when, she, when the mother got vaccinated, she did it at 30 weeks. Mm -hmm. And by the 34th week, her placenta had completely stopped growing. Mm. And her daughter, who was in the 40th percentile at the previous ultrasound, was now in the 4th percentile. And then within five days of that, her placenta ruptured. And, and I was just trying to understand what a placental abruption was. It's just, so I was it, looking it, on TikTok, yeah. and there are so many third trimester placental abruptions oh, yeah. in the last few years. Well, so that's no, why that's I, always. It's always been around. Always. Okay. Yeah, there's there's placenta that it's, it slings over the cervix, and there's placenta that pulls away from the uterine wall. That's the abruption, and it's a, it's okay. a pretty common thing. And intrauterine growth retardation is a pretty common thing. Though some people are saying now it's more common, and then you have other people saying it's not. So, uh, pregnancy is one of the areas for me. I'm still looking 
carefully at the literature because I, I, I don't quite get it. I don't quite get why there's right. such disparity in what people are experiencing there. And you have guys like Dr. Thorpe who are saying that, oh, I'm seeing horrible things on a daily basis. And you have people like, as I said, like Vicki Mail who are singing the virtues of all this, but making it seem like COVID is really seriously problematic for pregnant women, which also doesn't fit what I've been seeing. So, right. yeah, it's very, very difficult to, to sort this stuff out. All right, so uh, coming well, I up. I was reading now yes. the WHO... HWO. World Health Organization, yes. Um, wants women to get it in the third trimester so that the baby will have the COVID vaccine antibodies when they're born and that the infants should be vaccinated. And I mm. refuse to believe that's okay. Like, I, that's just me and my heart, but that's what they're saying. Again, I, ba babies get COVID, but... Did they get no, is I it know. that big a problem? And it, it's I just guess like, it is, it is. Okay. So what we're in, a, we live in a world where people are convinced the vaccine is harm, like completely harmless. And that just doesn't fit what I've been seeing. If I were convinced of that, I'd go with that. I, I understand COVID is, you know, occasionally nasty, but so, and so unusually but also, so. Who, who runs the HWO? Look, I, I don't want to try to second guess what's going on there, but the New England Journal of Medicine had an article out yesterday that was talking about incidents of cardiovascular events and uh, pulmonary emboli in post-vaccinated patients, and they had about 300,000 vaccinated patients. And the, the incidence of these various problems, particularly pulmonary emboli, was rather, frankly, remarkably high, but still quite rare given that it was like three or 400 out of 300,000 kind of, kind of situation. Um, the total was probably a thousand events, uh, again, out of 300,000 that, but that's, again, it, it's hard for me to get the epidemiology right on that. They're claiming that the odds ratio of that is not that different than the average person. So did they do the age adjust? Did they age adjust for that properly? It, again, it's very, that's a lot of pulmonary emboli, a lot of heart attacks, more so than I would think in a young population, but they didn't age adjust. So I'm, I'm, I'm still a little confused by that data. All right, so... Uh, didn't they also say that the vaccine didn't cross the placenta? At one point, there was things like that, yeah, of course. Yeah, but now so. they're like, oh, it, it, it's good for the baby. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's confusing. Well, that, mm, is that... Hmm, we'll say that's not because the vaccine crosses. Might that be... The, no, they said get the vaccine in the third trimester because the baby will have... I understand, have... but that's the spike protein, maybe not the vaccine. Maybe the mother's producing spike protein, that crosses. So, the, I mean, it's probably what's happening, not the not the liquid... Net, the Isn't LNPs the spike protein what you don't want? <laughs> well, that's the question. That's the question. Aren't we talking about that with our... Okay, so uh, let's talk about what's coming up next and who's coming up next week. Uh, can we see that up there, Caleb? And I'll let you go do your baby duty. You're four minutes late. He's getting grumpy. We are. Simon gets on April 4th. William Mackis with Kelly Victor on April 5th. Jimmy Dore on April 6th. Uh, Dr. Robert, you got it. Me. Jimmy Dore, everybody on Rumble is like, please, please, please. Uh, Asim Alhatra coming in with Dr. Victor on April 25th. So we will see you next April 4th, which I believe is Tuesday. Correct, Susan? I believe I that think should so. be. We'll see you on Tuesday with Simone Goddick. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Getting addicted to painkillers is like so the worst. scary. Yeah, the I worst. remember when I had my wisdom teeth taken out and they gave me hydrocodone and I just knew how bad it was mm. when I when I had to take it. I would make sure to do something unpleasant so oh, that my brain look, look would, at you with your cognitive science would associate hydrocodone. <laughs> so I took I, I took hydrocodone and I went Christmas shopping and it was one of the worst experiences of my life. And now every time I think about it, I'm like, oh, I don't want to I don't want to do this.